Thank you, everybody. Good morning. Um, and thank you to Jake and Amy and the Winston-Salem Can crew for putting this together. This is a big deal. This is the first of its kind in Winston-Salem, and it's a good sign to me that we're making progress, that there are enough people interested and involved that we have a bike summit in Winston-Salem. So that's, that's fantastic. So thank you guys very much. Um, thank you also to Councilmember Larson, Councilmember McIntosh. Uh, thank you for attending. I think if we are going to build a bike-friendly community, we need to have the advocates in the audience, we need to have the riders, we need to have our elected officials. I see city staff too, so that's good. We have everybody in the room that we need to build a bike-friendly community. Um, so Jake talked a lot about Madison, and, um, and obviously you heard from, from uh, my bio that that's where I went to school and that's where I worked for a while. So. I've been in Winston-Salem for, for nine years and was in Madison for about that same amount of time. So I think it's gonna be interesting, it's been interesting for me to be able to compare the bike culture and the walking and transit culture in Madison and compare it to here and hopefully bring some of the, the tools and techniques that I learned in Madison to, to Winston-Salem here. Um, so I want this to be interactive, so feel free to ask me questions. Um, and I think a big part of this is just I'm happy to share my experience in Madison. Um, I don't talk about that a whole lot because I want to focus on our specific needs here and, and the issues that we have and, and how we need to progress to be bike friendly here. Um, so the translation isn't necessarily one to one, but there are some things we can learn from that experience. So feel free to ask questions um, as I go along. And uh, yeah, I thank you all for attending and, and showing up today. Uh, so. Starting off, bike-friendly community. Jake talked a little bit about the League of American Bicyclists. We are a bronze level. So I've obviously heard the levels all the way up to diamond. Um, so we have some work to do. But I wanted to hear from you what all, you know, what do you think, what does a bike-friendly community look like? Um, just some, throw some ideas out there. What, what does it mean to you to be bike-friendly? What, what would our community look like? Safe. So, okay. Safe roads. All right. All right. So safe. Okay, so behavior issues? Kids on the bikes. All right, so accessible for everybody in the community? Overall ridership. Okay, yeah, so that's probably the key. You know, if, you, if we build the infrastructure and nobody's using it, or we have the programs and, and nobody's out there riding, did we really accomplish what we set out to do? Anything else? multi modes of trains. Okay, all right, so biking complementing the other modes of transportation? High parking. Okay. So end of trip facility is not about just getting to your destination, but what do you do at your destination? Incorporating future transportation farms like uh, low speed electric bikes. Okay. So that's an issue we're dealing now with scooters and autonomous vehicles. There's all sorts of technology and new, um, new transportation options out there. See strong, strong bike shops with accessibility for acquiring bikes. Okay. All right. So kind of the, the economy of biking too. I, that's one of my experiences from Madison actually is the, the companies that were there that were involved with cycling, Saris and Planet Bike and Trek and all of these major manufacturers and companies that you know, maybe don't contribute directly to the biking infrastructure or programs, but there's that culture in place, there's that expectation um, from those companies and, and the support from those companies as well. Anything else? Transit oriented. Development or real estate non All right. So back to the density yeah. idea that Jake mentioned. And I'll mention that a little bit in my presentation too, and the impact that that has on bikeability, walkability, and transit, just like you mentioned. Um, you can't really separate the bikeability from the walkability and, and the transit. If, if you look at communities that are bikeable, they're most likely walkable and have good transit service as well. Any other ideas? Integration of the bicycle infrastructure with the parks like that. Sure. Yeah, so taking advantage of the assets that we do have, not just viewing the parks as a park and recreation facility, but also as a transportation facility. And I think that's one area where um, we have done a good job is making sure that our greenway network, which is a recreation and park facility, can also be used for transportation. So that, that's a great start. That's exactly the kind of thing that we're trying to get at. Sorry for the, uh, the overlap there. This, I 
didn't notice that before. So, uh, looking at international bike-friendly communities, I think Jake may have coordinated with me on this presentation, because this is Copenhagen, and he talked about Copenhagen and Copenhagenize. And I figure once your city is used as a verb to describe bike friendliness, that's a good model for us to follow. That, that's a good sign if, if you're using Copenhagen as a verb. Um, so those are stats are a little bit hard to see, but on the left hand, that, that pie chart, all trips in Copenhagen, and then on the right hand side, trips to work or study in Copenhagen. 29% um, bicycle trips for all trips in the country, 41% uh, for commuting trips. Um, so that is a huge number. And, and if you see that image there, that's a street in Copenhagen. Now that's a, probably not the typical street, but that gives you an idea. If you create streets like that for people, you can see the people sitting at tables, somebody's walking a bike there. That is a very human scale environment and one that encourages people to bike and walk. Um, you can see their goals. So those are our 2025 goals to add essentially 9% to each one of those bike commute shares. Um, so that would bring trips to work and study up to 50%. So half of all trips would be, um, would be taken by, by bike if, if they can reach their goal. Um, you can see public transit makes up another big percentage in trips to work and study. And the car is only 25, 24%. Um, and the walking makes up the remainder there. So really the driving trips are the, the minority. So national bike friendly communities, that is a hard chart to see, but I'll read some of those off. And I think it's a good starting point for us. Um, these are communities that have established good bike programs and have seen results. Um, the, one of the stats up there that I'll read off a little bit is the percentage of commuters who travel by bike. Um, that's kind of the, the, the standard, right? If, if we're going to go through and create these policies and programs and create the infrastructure, in the end, what we want is people to use that infrastructure and, and bike to work or to school, wherever they're going. So come, going down that list, I'll read maybe the top 10 here. Davis, California, Santa Cruz, California, Boulder, Colorado, Palo Alto, Somerville, Massachusetts, Cambridge, Massachusetts, Berkeley, California, Miami Beach, Florida, and Portland, Oregon. Um, each one of those places has at least 6% mode share for, for biking and, or for biking trips. Um, compare that to, what was it, 40% in Copenhagen? So even the best places, Davis, California, 15.5%. Um, so obviously we are far, in the U.S., far behind what some other countries are doing. But there's, you know, some decent explanations for that. And that's kind of what I wanted to get into in this presentation today is, um, I think, you know, if you look at the League of American Bicyclists, their bike-friendly community application, that gives you the, the formula for how to become a bike-friendly community. What I'd like all of you to think about today is the next steps beyond that. So we know generally what it takes to be a bike-friendly community. You hope that taking advantage and, and building those, that infrastructure and those programs and policies leads to the, the change in, in mode share and that more people start biking. Real question is how do you get to that point? How do we get to the point where we're implementing those policies and, and building that infrastructure? Um, it's easy to say, all right, here's what we need to do. We need to build 100 miles of separated bike infrastructure on our streets and we need to have transportation demand management policies in place that um, encourage people to bike and walk more and take transit. But how do you actually get to that? And I think, you know, as an advocacy organization, Winston-Salem Can is in a position to, to think about those issues and what it's actually going to take to get the community in that, in that area. Um, Madison is on that list as well. There are a number of other communities. Is there, are there any patterns, those, of those 10 that I read, are there any patterns that you all see with those communities? West Coast? Co did college, did I hear? So a lot of college towns on here, which makes sense. Um, anything else with those communities? Medium size. Medium size, all right. Um, so you know, just thinking about Winston-Salem in that regard, um, we have how many colleges? Five colleges and universities? Yeah, so 
fair amount of student population, moderate sized community, Madison. One of the reasons we wanted to move here was it was comparable size to Madison. We liked that size community. Um, it's small enough that you don't deal with some of the issues of a big city, but large enough that you have a lot of the benefits and a lot of the amenities that come with big cities. Um, so, you know, while a lot of those are college towns where the college really has a, a major impact in the community, those stats, those save 15% mode share for biking, that's just one way. That's the absolute number, right? But there are a lot of communities that have made great strides where maybe they started at a very low mode share, and maybe they've only gotten up to 2 or 3%, but that's a 1,000% you know, increase in what they had previously. And perhaps those cities then are a better model for us. If we're starting where we don't have a huge mode share of, of cycling trips, how can we, what, what city should we model ourselves after? Is it realistic for us to model ourselves after Palo Alto, California? Is it realistic for Boulder or Berkeley? What are the other communities out there that have done good work in this regard that we can model ourselves after? So that's one thing to think about as well. Um, so the, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, Gainesville, Florida is on there. <laughs> Good point. Um, no. So, you know, how does the culture play into that as well? It's, um, and, and that's where, you know, the advocacy group can get involved too, is, is helping change that culture. Um, all of these things combined, all of the five or six E's combined help contribute to that culture as well. Um, well, culture, I'm thinking cycling culture. So there's a, yeah, there's some debate on, you know, do you need a bike culture or if you build the infrastructure and the programs, do you get the culture as a result of that? Or does the culture drive those infrastructure and program and policy improvements? Um, yeah, exactly. So there's a, a, it's, you know, what comes first, the chicken or the egg in that situation? And, and I think, um, I don't have a, a great answer for that. If I did, we would probably be a platinum level city right now. <laughs> um, but I don't know if anybody has a great answer for that. And I think that's why we need to work together to figure that out. Um, so I mentioned, what is it about? One interesting thing yeah. to do is with the bird scooters. Yeah. Talk about culture change really fast. Sure. In Winston, but a lot of other southern cities. Yeah. It's caught on really fast. I think culture can change. And that, that's you know, a good discussion point is how do those scooters change the way, potentially change the way, how we design streets. Um, and does designing streets for scooters then contribute to designing them for biking as well? And can we, can we benefit all the active transportation groups as we kind of uh, evolve in the way we design our roadways? Um, so I mentioned, what is it about those places that makes them leaders? What can we gain from their experiences? You know, we're looking for models, we're looking for, we don't want to recreate anything, there are a lot of cities that have done a great job with this. What can we borrow from them? And then what are the limitations? You know, what, in what areas is it just not realistic for us to, say, New York City? It's a completely different, different situation, um, different urban landscape, just different, everything's different, right? But we can borrow some techniques from them, but we may not be able to borrow everything from them. So we have to pick and choose from communities to, to make it work here. Dr. Matthew? Yes. At Interbike last year, the guest speaker was from Indianapolis, Indiana, yeah. and they have made dramatic changes mm -hmm. in Indianapolis. Have you heard anything about Indianapolis, Indiana? I have. I mean, I know I've used some of their, they, they've, they have this beautiful trail, river walk. Yes. Um, that is kind of, that's the highlight of their, their system. But, um, you know, I don't know, let's look back. I don't think they were, they're not on this list. I think uh, Bloomington, Indiana was, but another college right. town. Um, but I would guess Indiana or Indianapolis is probably on that list of, of cities that maybe the mode share isn't that high, but their mode share percentage increase has been dramatic where they didn't have a lot of riders to begin with, but you know, I, I don't know what percentage increase, but I imagine it could be one of the higher ones. So um, that may be a better model for us to follow as well. Thank you. Sure. Um, and then how should we become a bike-friendly community? What, what are the priorities for us? What do we need to focus on first? Because there's limited resources, limited time. Which areas do we focus on first? 
So the five E's, six E's, um, we add equity to this because every, every other E in this category can benefit from having an equity discussion involved it, it, within it. Um, so engineering, encouragement, education, um, and evaluation, and enforcement. I should know these by heart by now. And I <laughs> usually do. So starting with engineering, this is the one that everybody thinks of, right? So these are the bike lanes, the cycle tracks, the trails, the, the opportunities to actually get out and ride. Um, for us, 25 miles of on-street facilities. We're working on another 10, 15 miles this year. Um, and then uh, we'll, we'll continue to design more, hopefully another 10 next year. Um, and then um, we're always looking at uh, resurfacing projects whenever we can, whatever opportunities come up, NCDOT projects, roadway projects. We're always thinking about how we can incorporate biking and walking and, and transit infrastructure into those projects as well. And I think Business 40 project is a good example of that. You know, $100 million roadway project that NCDOT is managing, but um, city staff, former city staff, did a lot of work and, and elected officials to encourage NCDOT to, to make sure that all the biking and walking infrastructure would be covered as well. So there are a couple of beautiful bridges that will come out of that that will be bike and pedestrian only. Um, a path alongside Business 40, which will be kind of a not one of a kind, but a very, uh, very unique project in the country. Greenways and paths. So this is kind of the backbone of our, our cycling network. And, and this hits upon what people are really looking for. So when survey after survey that we've done that is done nationally, what people want is separation from motor vehicles. It comes back to that safety comment. Obviously, if you're on a separated facility, your likelihood of being in a crash is greatly reduced, especially a, a trail like this, unless it's a maintenance vehicle, right? And I'm willing to take my, my chances with the maintenance vehicles. Um, so this is the, the backbone of our system, Salem Creek Greenway. We've made a concerted effort to build extensions of the Salem Creek Greenway or branches off of it. So we start to have a network instead of individual trails that serve uh, maybe neighborhoods, we have this well-connected system of trails that now with the Long Branch Trail, can, you can, I rode from my house this morning, Salem Creek Greenway to the Long Branch Trail. I was on the street for about a half a mile. The rest of my trip was on the trail. And that's the kind of thing we want to recreate around the, the community. So you can see some of the additional projects. There are a lot of projects that are funded in design, getting ready for construction. Um, Brushy Fork, Piedmont Regional, Salem Creek, uh, business 40, Lantern Ridge was just completed, and Long Branch Trail was just completed. Almost all of those projects are attached to the Salem Creek Greenway or extensions of it itself. And um, if we can continue that kind of expansion of that network, we're going to allow a lot more people to be able to ride. Um, so somebody mentioned the end of trip facilities, the bike parking. So that's the other thing about the infrastructure. It's not just bike lanes and trails, it's what do you have at the end of your trip. So we've, we've, done a, we've made some efforts, made some strides in that regard. We had a, a bike parking project several years ago where we greatly expanded our bike parking program. And then a few years ago, working with uh, the planning department, updating the unified development ordinance to include bike parking for all new developments, most new developments. Um, uh, and that's crucial. Those are the kinds of policies and changes that will have a long-term impact. Um, you know, we can do these one-time projects like the 300 bike parking stalls added throughout the community, but it's those incremental changes through the, essentially the UDO, the Unified Development Ordinance, um, sets the guidelines for how new development is done in the city. And by attaching a bike parking requirement to that, that UDO, that means that development you know, um, down, down the line, years from now, will all have bike parking. So we're getting these incremental changes that happen over years. And it's those kinds of changes that will really have the biggest impact. Yeah, Judy. Does the uh, ordinance specify what kind of bike parking? It does. So um, it specifies the quantity. And then we have a set of guidelines that developers have to follow. Because you're right, if, if we have bike parking, but it's terrible bike parking that does not support the bike and does not work, then nobody's going to use it and they'll continue to lock their bikes up to street signs or light poles, whatever the case is. But you're right, yeah, so there, there are standards that 
uh, national organizations for cycling have created that we can borrow, and we, we uh, included those in that parking ordinance. Um, just to touch on this real quickly, I know Michael Hosey is going to talk about this later, but bike share, so engineering kind of bleeds into the encouragement side as well. Um, but bike share obviously has become huge, and um, the model that we have has been um, really fantastic for us here. I know there are other models now. There's the dockless bike share programs that are out there, and I imagine eventually we'll, have, we'll be dealing with that as well. But um, to make bikes available on the streets for people, whether it's a dock system like we have or a dockless system, um, that's great engineering in a sense. It's infrastructure, but it's also encouragement. If you see the bikes on the street, that are easy to pick up, you're likely to, to try one of those, especially if it's in conjunction with good infrastructure. So this station's at Bailey Park, immediately adjacent to the Long Branch Trail. Um, so if we can combine the, the infrastructure, the trail development with the bike share um, development, you know, all the better. Yes? Um, I know nationwide, I don't, we don't have anything specific for our community yet, but I know nationwide, I think scooter share rides are outpacing bike share rides like four to one. Um, you know, I imagine it, scooter share has to be eating into the bike share rides somewhat. Um, I don't, I think it may be just a little too early to know exactly how, but that, that's my assumption at least. Um, so getting back to some of those model communities and, and digging a little bit deeper into the engineering side. So it's easy to talk about the infrastructure and what we need to do to, to encourage more cycling. But there are these other factors, and Jake touched on this a little bit with, with his presentation. You can see some of those bullet points there. The separated infrastructure, that's kind of the, the key. Um, one of the things, like I said, survey after survey shows that that's what people want. They want the separation from motor vehicles, and that's what encourages more ridership. Um, but those other stats there, the population density, transit and walkability, the compact urban form versus suburban sprawl, and then urban versus suburban street streetscapes. So those are some of the issues that, it's not exhaustive by any means, but some of the issues that maybe we don't think about as much when it comes to cycling and what makes for a bike-friendly community that really do have an impact that aren't as easy as adding 20 miles of bike lanes to our streets or adding more bike parking. These are longer-term issues that, um, that need to be addressed in order for us to become bike friendly. And Jake mentioned sprawl. Um, you can see on that list, this is a most sprawling metro, small metro areas, less than 500,000 people. Winston-Salem is you know, about, what, 10 from the bottom of that list. So that's part of the, the challenge for us, right, is that we have this history of a sprawling development pattern. Um, and if, if we're sprawling, that means people are spread out more. That means destinations are spread out more. Doesn't mean that we can't be bike friendly. It just means that the challenges that we face are different from, say, what New York City faces, where everything is compact. There's a high population density. Um, you know, here, we're going to be dealing with some different issues. So how can we connect you know, where people live to where they work and where they shop if those distances are a little bit further apart? And, and who are our models then? You know, New York City has been touted as a great model for communities to follow because they've done all of this Vision Zero work. They've, done, they've added a lot of bike infrastructure to their streets. Um, but maybe that's not the best model for us to follow because our form, our density, everything is just different. Um, so who are those models? Can anybody think of who, who the comparable communities might be for us? What, who can we learn the most from? Any ideas? What Chapel those, so Chapel Hill. Um, other ideas? Who else is bronze in the state of North Carolina? I think most communities are bronze. I think Carborough, maybe silver. Um, but I think, I think Raleigh, Charlotte, Durham, Asheville, Asheville bronze. Asheville, they, maybe silver. I think most communities in the state, though, are bronze. Um, but you know, because we have more of a suburban kind of development pattern, you know, maybe communities like Cary, who have you know, done a lot to, um, to make sure that trails are included in development. 
and they've done a lot to develop their trail system. Raleigh, obviously, with their trail system. Um, now, those communities may not rank high on the existing uh, mode share for bike trips, not a top 10 city for that, but um, they may have increased their ridership significantly over, over their baseline levels. So maybe that's a good community for us to follow. Um, population density, just to talk a little bit more about that. Um, New York City, oh yeah, go ahead, Bob. Just a quick question. Yeah. Is there any Sure. And that'll help alleviate traffic in the downtown like the business for closure and everything else. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't think I, there's nothing formal in that regard, but I think the opportunities are there. You know, clearly Marketplace Mall is probably the, the prime example. But I know people have parked at the gateway Y and taken the strollway into town. Um, there are probably numerous examples that we could set up and, and kind of market as you know uh, what park and bike essentially. So yeah, that's a, a great idea. With that? Yeah. <laughs> um, so the density side of things, New York City, 27,000 people per square mile. I think Copenhagen, 17,000 people per square mile. Winston-Salem, I should say, um, what did I see? Raleigh, Charlotte, they're about 3,000 people per square mile. Winston-Salem is 1,700 per square mile. So Again, not necessarily good or bad, just different. And how do we address, you know, how do we make this a bike-friendly community based on the, the issues that we have, um, based on our context? Um, transit and walkability, again, if you're bikeable, you, in a lot of cases, are probably walkable and, and transit-friendly as well. And you really need to have those things in place. You have to have a good transit system in place in order to support the biking infrastructure. Um, so that people have other options in case they can't bike. On the encouragement side, moving on to the next E, uh, Walk and Roll Winston-Salem. This was our Open Streets event. Open Streets is a worldwide movement, essentially where the streets are repurposed for a short period of time for active participation, active transportation, biking, walking, skating, whatever the case is. Um, we've been doing this for eight, nine years, I believe. Now we're partnering, partnering with the uh, Winston-Salem Cycling Classic um, to make that happen. So this is a way to, to get people thinking about biking and walking, get them out on the streets, get them active, and then hopefully that translates over to um, continued use. More encouragement, the Winston-Salem Cycling Classic. So anything that puts cycling in a good light, that promotes our economy, that um, gets cycling in the public eye is a good thing even if it's not specifically transportation related. Um, piggyback on that, the National Cycling Center. So they've become a fantastic partner for the city, not only with the share program that's out there that Michael will talk about later, but helping with some of our safe routes to school work, some of the bike education that we do in the schools. Um, so having partners like that in the community that can kind of advance the goals that we have, um, that's a great thing for us to be able to, to take advantage of. So, on the encouragement side, the other side of that is it's not just about encouraging people to ride, but what are the other the options for people? And you know, a lot of the places where mode share is high, it's most likely a little bit difficult to drive there, difficult or expensive, um, and that make that puts cycling in a good light. Then, if that's a good option alternative for people to use. Um, then they're likely to use that. Whereas if it's, if it's cheap, it's easy to drive, you're going to get some hardcore cyclists. There will be people who prefer to ride the bike, but for the average commuter, if, if it's easy, cheap, and, and free to, to drive, or not free, but um, if that's the, the easiest option, then that's what people will, will do. Um, so congestion plays a part of that. If, you know, if your city is congested and there is a lot of traffic and you're spending 45 minutes in the car each day, then cycling is looking more appealing. Transit is looking more appealing at that point. Um, the cost, so, um, you know, looking at, I think it was uh, the Netherlands, and this is just one factor, but, you know, $7 per gallon for gas, that's, that is, uh, you know, a discouragement for driving, really. And 
while it's not directly related to what we can do about cycling to promote cycling, it's having a dramatic impact on the number of people who are riding and, and how they're choosing to, to move about that community. I have transportation demand management on there because my work, I worked at the University of Wisconsin as the bike and pedestrian coordinator there and I was in the transportation demand management department. And that was really, that was a model uh, program for me and, and one that I think can, can really have an impact on, on other communities. Essentially the situation there was there were 60 to 70,000 people who came to the campus every day, 40,000 students or so, 10,000 faculty, staff, visitors, and parking was at a premium. There were, the city and the, the, the university worked together to limit the amount of parking on campus to about 10,000 stalls. So you have 10,000 parking stalls, 60,000 people coming to the campus, obviously not everybody's going to be driving there. It's just not an option. So the transportation demand management department set pricing for parking on campus. Right now, parking is anywhere from $1,000 to $1,300 per year to park on campus, which it's a lot for parking, but probably based on the market, it's really not that much. Um, you know, what is that, $100 per month to be able to park full time? And what city was that? That was Madison, Wisconsin. Yeah, so I worked for the university there and then there was a big TDM department within the university. So that money that was generated from the parking revenues was then reinvested. It was reinvested into the biking infrastructure, in the walking infrastructure, in the transit system. So everybody on campus has access to a free, and now it's $50, I believe, a $50 bus pass that is good for the entire transit system um, year round. So unlimited rides. So you could ride as much as you want on the transit system for $50. And that is um, you know, supplemented by the revenues generated through parking. Um, and you can take your bike for free on the bus. And that's right. So you can take the bike for free. There was, uh, you know, some of that money was invested in bike parking on the campus. So there was high security bike parking, whether it was in a cage or lockers. Um, so th th that money was reinvested in the system. And on the transit side, I know we're talking about biking, but the transit, you know, that certainly supports the biking side. What that does then, with that many people riding transit and having access to bus passes, it helps the transit system. So there, the transit system is then generating all of this income based on this huge contract that they have with the university. Um, so that's helping the, the transit system throughout the community because it's, you know, they have more revenue, they're able to run buses more frequently, that's in turn helping the cyclists who need maybe to, to go beyond how far they feel like biking themselves. So, can, I, can I contrast that with sure. just one element of our policy here was to sell our, our parking policy. It's 25 cents an hour from 8 o'clock in the morning until 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And then it's free on street. Okay, so we have tons of free parking, which mm -hmm. does not encourage people, it encourages people to drive. That's right. Uh, parking decks have to have you know, 35 hours a month mm -hmm. to $60 a month. And it's, there's no disincentive. That's right. To yeah. Um, and we're going to face, I mean, I'm going to try to push parking rates up for multiple reasons, but this is one of them. Mm. And it'll be a major public benefit. Sure. Yeah, exactly. And that's not easy. Even, you know, on the university campus, every year when the parking rates increase, that was a major battle. And, you know, even in a place that is a bike friendly community, that is a tough, tough, uh, <laughs> tough process to go through. So, you know, and that's why I think at the beginning I said, the, the techniques are not the difficult part. We, we have models, we know what would work. It's how do we make it work here? And that's where I think this room is, can really contribute. How do we work together to make that happen? Have we tried that in Salem with the bus system? Uh, uh, one fee, you think? Well, I mean, so in Madison, it was, it was a partnership between the city and the university. So, you know, one couldn't do it with the, without the other. So it was that partnership between those agencies. So, Say, you know, if, if um, the city worked with WSSU, um, I don't know how that would work exactly, but it, that would be the, the comparable situation here. Um, so, just to, to point out, yes, yes. The question of the parking yeah. to interject has been a great success. It's one year since the opening of the Wings Blue Line extension a few months ago in Charlotte, uh, the Charlotte Area Transit System has embraced that student fee. Mm. Um, associated with, with 
for all the students. It's done a great job of making the revenue stream for the Charlotte area transit more consistent. Mm -hmm. So we know year over year what the budget's going to be. What it now is turning into is this evolution of, of providing more amenities and services that are not car centric. So we're looking at continuous linear facilities along transit corridors. We're looking yeah. at enhancing our bus stop locations to have sheltered area for pedestrians as well as temporary bike parking, yeah. short term bike parking, etc. So we're seeing this opportunity with a consistent revenue stream with a public private partnership or partnership with Kenwatch to, to provide greater amenities and service profiles for all transit mm -hmm. users. And our integration of bikes and buses and on transit is it began a little over a decade ago as well, on its way to two million bikes and buses along yeah. in, in a documented kind of data stream. So I wanted to throw that in. Sure. Yeah, and I mean, if, if nothing else, take away from this presentation that the cycling friendliness of our community does not exist in a vacuum. It's dependent on our density, it's dependent on our development patterns, on um, the transit network, and all of these other policies, like the TDM policies that could be in place. Um, and what, uh, one thing on your graph there. Mm -hmm. When I go to Europe, I do a study, I take a rental car and I do a rally in the town, and then I ride an e-bike. And in most all cases, riding the electric bike is half the time mm -hmm. of driving a car. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. If you know, if, if driving is taking a long time, people are going to look for other options. And you know what? I know L.A. wasn't one of the top twenty cities in the world, but New York City, you know that that certainly is tied together. The fact that they have high congestion and then have made the effort to improve the bike infrastructure and encourage more people to ride. Um, our education program, see Ms. Judy Wallace there in attendance today, help spearhead the Safe Routes to School program here. Um, we, we work with the schools a lot. One of the programs is an education program that we're working with the Cycling Center on now um, to take a fleet of bikes around to different schools and, um, and train kids in elementary schools on bike safety skills. Um, we even work with the, uh, the Safe Kids Coalition out of Baptist Medical Center to make sure that those kids then are given a free helmet after they go through that training program. So twofold effect on that. Kids know how to bike and they know how to do so safely. At least they've gone through that education. The other, the other hope, and uh, you know, may not pay off immediately, but once these kids then become drivers, they've gone through this bike education program. They know what it's like to ride a bike. They know the kind of the um, you know, the, as drivers, they'll be more aware of, of cyclists on the road. So, Has there been any pushback from schools discouraging kids from riding bikes to school? Uh, yeah, there is some. I mean, certain schools, you know, whether it's the environment in which they're located, and maybe it's just not a very bikeable location, or maybe it's a principal who just doesn't want to expose the school to that potential perceived risk. Um, there is some pushback, but there are certain schools that are promoting it as well and, and understand the value of it. Um, so model communities for education, um, mentioned, uh, let's see, the, the training and testing, that's kind of the European model where the kids go through the education program as young kids and then take a test essentially at, uh, say, age 12, so they become licensed cyclists. That's kind of what we were trying to recreate with the, the Safe Routes to School program. Smart Trips, that's probably the most interesting one. This is a program um, out of Portland where they actually do marketing to individuals. So reach out to individuals and say, how are you getting to, to work or to school right now? And is there something we can do to help, it, help you bike or walk more? Um, can we give you resources? Can we give you information about safe routes? Um, what can we do to, to encourage that? So that is a very labor intensive um, effort. Um, evaluation, so we have bike and pedestrian counters at various locations around the city. You can see some of the stats there. Sorry for the overlap again. Salem Lake, 60,000 bike trips annually. Um, so obviously if you build it, they will come. They will, people seek out those kinds of opportunities. Fourth Street downtown, uh, 24,000 bike trips annually. That's between Cherry Street and Marshall Street. Um, the other part of that is the pedestrian count on 4th Street, 1.4 million walking trips per year. And 4th Street is a great model here. It's, it was a street that was, I believe it was one way, um, very wide, 
about what, 10, 12, 13? I don't know how many years ago that was. It was changed to what it, its current configuration, one lane in each direction, and a lot of space for people. And look at how successful that is. Uh, 1.4 million walking trips per year comes out to, what was it, I think 5,000 or so walking trips per day. The vehicle trips on 4th Street are 5,500 per day. So in our city, it is the street that has the closest, the highest, uh, essentially the closest ratio of walking to motor vehicle trips. And so if you invest in those kinds of streets, you get those kinds of results. Um, evaluation, continuing that, we do a crash analysis, and I'm short on time, so I'm gonna rush through some of this. Crash analysis, needs analysis, and speed analysis to figure out where we have safety issues, um, where we have potential to see more biking trips and then um, using that in our planning. Uh, the enforcement side, um, you know, we need to work with the police department to make sure that the laws that are out there are being enforced and that cyclists and pedestrians feel safe on the streets. Um, these are just some Probably the, the, the key takeaway here, if you're not familiar with Vision Zero, take a look at that. It's a comprehensive uh, approach that cities are taking to address roadway safety. So it looks at infrastructure, it looks at programming, enforcement, education, all of those things in one package, and it's called Vision Zero. Equity, so again, equity kind of influences all of the other E's. Um, how good of a job are we doing maybe as a city to reach out to communities that haven't been involved in the past? Um, what efforts are we making to do that? And what's next? So coming back to those original questions, I think the, the last one really is the key. How should Winston-Salem, what, what, considering our unique situation, what tools, what techniques do we need to implement to become a bike-friendly or a higher level bike-friendly city? And there are some good things happening. So um, this is the Business 40 multi-use path alignment. Um, feel free to I encourage everybody to take a look at that. If you haven't seen the video rendering of what that will look like, do a search for that. It's a beautiful video that shows what our transportation system could look like. So there are some great things happening here, um, but obviously we have a lot of room to grow yet as well. So thank you all. Questions? <laughs> Yeah, I think I'm going to become an e-bike salesman, actually. I, I love my electric bike. Um, I think for me, here, since we have a three-year-old at home, and I just don't have the time I used to have to bike as much, and the electric bike allows me to bike essentially as much as I used to before, just in less time. The other thing is the hills. So this is a hilly place, and that, you know, while there are a lot of pla hilly places that are bike-friendly, that is a major obstacle here. That's, that's a tough one for a lot of people to get over. The electric bike takes care of that issue. Um, the other is the heat, and I, you know, this is how I dress for work, and I can bike in these clothes in the summer, use the electric bike, and still show up to a meeting and not look like a mess. Um, <laughs> which, if you want to be taken seriously about these biking and walking issues, you can't show up looking like you just walked off the Tour de France, so um, I, I try to, to keep that in mind. Yeah. I'm just wondering, you know, is there any progress on uh, you know, that rail line from downtown Long Stratford and that? Yeah, so that, rails? yeah, that rail line is owned by Norfolk Southern Rail Company, and yeah, they, they don't have any interest in using their line for a bike trail. If at some point they want to abandon that and don't have any interest in maintaining it anymore, I think that would probably be the opportunity to come in and turn it into a trail, but. That is a fantastic idea. I mean, you know, you, you talk about the density of people and destinations. Well, Stratford Road, and I mean, that is a model project, and it would be a fantastic yeah, I mean, project. That would it's, be a main yeah, yeah. You, you're exactly right. No question. Yeah. Let's give it up for Matthew. Thank you. <laughs> Presentation eight into yours. So um, we're going to take a quick, like, five minute 
just rotate everybody in and out and then and then go right back to it. So feel free to take a bathroom break or whatever, but we're gonna we're gonna pop right back into it.